Now that I have the radio playing fairly well, I noticed that at higher volumes the speaker was sounding really rattly. I knew about this tear here, but what I didn't realize was that there's a pretty significant one here too, and I think that's what I was really hearing, where I was really hearing the buzzing coming from. And uh, a little bit of a tear over here too. So I'm going to go around this and examine it in more detail, patch up any tears, and then coat the whole thing with good old Eileen's tacky glue. Because this cone is pretty dry and brittle. You can see it's starting to crack over here too. So I'm going to use um, somewhat diluted glue on these areas. And once that sets up, you really dilute this and then just coat the whole thing. It'll soak into the paper fibers and when it dries it'll reinforce it but still uh, retain some flexibility. I've got that torn edge patched up and that tear there. And I was going around and I found on the opposite side from that tear, if anything it's even worse. So man, no wonder this thing was sounding ratty. And then of course we finally have that hole there. That hole, at least I know where that came from because that corresponds to a hole in the grill cloth. It looks like, and this was, this was there when I got it. Like a kid had stuck a, a pencil or something like right through the grill cloth into the speaker. But these torn edges, I don't know. Uh, but uh, it's a lot easier to just dab a little glue on that than to even think about replacing the cone. I let the glue on the tears set up overnight, and then this morning I spread diluted glue over the whole cone. Probably about two parts water to one part glue, and that's set up now. And paper's all nice and reinforced, flexible, and everything's fine as if it never had any tears. So even on the areas where there were tears now, I didn't use any reinforcing paper, nothing like that. Just the glue and the existing fibers in the paper cone. Or all it takes to hold it all back together. Alright, so let me get that out of the way so it doesn't get torn again. Uh, so, the next thing I want to do is clean up these wires that were spliced and who knows why, and uh, replace the speaker wire, which is just really not safe with exposed wire along its length. Now, I got a tip about how to deal with this. Now, I wasn't sure. I thought that was riveted on there or something, and there's really no easy way to get this apart. Well, I got a tip that, that you can actually pull that out with a little bit of careful effort. Well, I experimented on my uh, the wire I salvaged from my other 38.7 chassis. And yeah, indeed, you can pull it out. Here's the wire I salvaged out of my spare 38.7 chassis. And as you can see, it's in much better condition, even though they're the same age. You can even tell the colors, white green and striped white green, whereas these are all yellowy and very brittle. Now, the problem with this one is the end of the plug is in bad shape. The cardboard disc was virtually gone. It was very torn up. And uh, by experimenting on here, I found that, yeah, with a little bit of uh, effort, that just pops out. So I was going to pop the disc out of this one and transplant the wires from here to here, but now I'm thinking that's, that's an awful lot of work now that I've got this one apart. And uh, you know, why don't I just either fabricate one of these or just transplant the disc from here to here? The only final th question is, is are these wires long enough? to be a little shorter. This came from a tabletop. This is for the chair side. I imagine the speaker in a chair side is a bit further away than the tabletop. And I know the wires have to run into the chassis and there's a knot that got tied in here so this is about where it would emerge from the chassis. And yeah, ooh, that's about a foot shorter. Yeah, um, boy, hmm, well, 
I'm going to have to scrap that idea and I'll just use some new wire. Uh, when it comes to that, what wire to use? Well, I do have this cloth cover reproduction stuff, which is really nothing more than PVC plastic insulated wire with cloth around it. Consequently, it's really thick stuff. So here's the original wire, which is much, it's like half the diameter, or less than half the diameter. I mention that because if I go with three pieces of this, I don't think it'll fit through the hole in the chassis, or it's very difficult. I think I did it once before on a radio like this. There's a, there's a hole in the metal chassis that's got a brass ring around it, and that's where the speaker wire has to go through. So, I can cut this old wire out and give it a try, but I think it's going to be very tight fit or it's not going to make it at all. Or, of course, I can use modern wire, plastic coated, but this is solid. Don't know if that makes a big difference or not. And a final option I've got on hand is this stuff, which is also solid. It calls pushback, because instead of stripping it, you can just push back on the insulation and expose the bare wire. I think it's the same, or maybe just one notch smaller gauge than this. Uh, this is also solid, so it can't withstand a lot of flexing. The other issue with this is it's unrated, so I don't know really how much voltage you could put on it. Now, this radio doesn't have all that much voltage on the speaker wire, so it probably wouldn't matter. So, I could take uh, three pieces of this, different colors, and kind of twist them together like this and go with that. Be somewhat vintagey look. Or just go with the plastic and just go all modern. I, what I wish I had, if I'm going to go modern, is some PVC plastic insulated stranded wire. But I just don't. I really need to order up some spools of that. I just got, I got an assortment of colored uh, solid, because solid is easier to work with. When you're wrapping wire around terminals and whatnot underneath the chassis. So the only strand that I've got is this big thick stuff. But, you know, I'll give this a shot first, see if I can fit it through the hole. If so, I'll, I'll go with it. Well, no matter what I go with, I know there's one thing I can do. And that's get rid of this. And see if I can pop that center out. So, how do I don't want to approach that. I guess I'll try a razor blade. Just want to get it started. Hmm, it's something pretty tight. If I keep pushing down, I'm just going to snap the uh, tip off of this. Another well, thought is to put something down the center of the right diameter. It's too big. And let's see if I can kind of pop it out. I think I'm just going to have to get a little more aggressive here. I'm never going to get this thing out. There we go. <laughs> just to take a flat brass screwdriver and just, just go for it and just shoved it down in there and it popped out. Alright. Should be able to reuse that cardboard. Now I can shove these wires through, get at those connectors, and solder some new one. No, I was about to hang out anyways to, or head out to run some errands. Maybe I'll stop by the hardware store and see if uh, I can get some stranded 18 gauge maybe, or no, 20 gauge a stranded hookup wire that's not outrageously expensive and is in uh, decent colors. It turns out there is enough room for three of these reproduction cloth cover wires to fit through the chassis hole, so no need for me to run out and buy any. One thing I did notice is that this yellow is thicker than the others, so I don't know why that would be. Pretty darn sure the wire gauge inside is identical. 
think it's just how tight the uh, the weave is in the, uh, the cloth. Not a huge difference, but definitely is thicker. All right, anyways. So I'll run these wires through. Uh, originally they uh, tied a knot. On the other side is a strain relief. I suppose I can do the same. And they twisted them together. I'm not going to bother with that because it's just too bulky to twist together. But what I will do is periodically put a little heat shrink tubing around the three. Shrink it up to lock them together. Hopefully I can use some of this white stuff. It won't be quite as jarring as using black heat shrink tubing on it. Let's see. Yeah, I'm sure this will fit. Alright, so I'll cut off a few pieces, like an inch long, and slide them along the length. Speaking of length, yeah, the this challenge is I've got to make sure that I leave myself plenty of length. So I can both wire it into the chassis, tie a knot in it, run it all the way over to the speaker. So the wires, what's left of them, are running off over here. So the longest one goes about there. And tie a knot. Release that long. And give myself a bit of extra. Alright, about there should be plenty long enough. But you know what? I'll go even a little bit longer. Now the last uh, challenge, I suppose, is to get this all right. So the original wires are so discolored, I can't even tell what these are. So I'll have to rely on the schematic. Uh, both at the end it goes on the chassis, and then of course when I hook it back up to the speaker. So it's almost 2 in the morning and I'm working late on this radio as usual. Put on the radio, put on WGN. And I just hear them wrapping up coverage for the Cubs game. And I'm thinking, what the heck? Turns out it was just the longest game in Cubs history. It was over six hours long against the Colorado Rockies. And the, hey, the Cubs won. Which is crazy. And now the, uh, <laughs> the guys who would normally be on the radio this late at night are, are just finally back on after the coverage of the game ended and they're all joking about it, how crazy the game was. Broadcasting the game. Makes him sound so powerful. And um, he is powerful. He's very powerful. Right, so, <laughs> and, uh, and so, we'll move away. Had the game gone two wires are going to the 6S six 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 right. circuit. And, you were, you were very and one is going to the power spot. Like it's going to be for the field coil. I, you know, I mean, I do my Saturday show from down here. Right. You know, but I prefer upstairs. All right. Yeah, plus it would just be, you want your things about you. Well, that's the thing. I like to go in and set up. Mm -hmm. You know, and. Plus, uh, this would have been awkward. I had to, like, pack all my stuff up. White. Yep. 6S6. You got a lot of material. I do. Well, for, for, for an eight minute show. And, oh, the other one is going to rectify. Okay. Uh, uh, that's easy enough. The striped one is the one that does not go to the 6 of 6 Now, I don't have a striped wire, so solid green, solid white. I figured yellow is good enough to represent the striped wire. And that's the one that's longest, so I'll do that one first. You know, we, we play all kinds of, you know, we, I was ready to get board games out and everything. Yeah. Yeah. It was like camping. It was like a, a little bit. Yeah. There were beers had. Well, yeah, why would you not? There's, the game was going strong. Like, well, I guess I'll just wire them up, tie the knot, and then run them through the hole in the chest. Yeah. The other thing was, how did people stay there? 
I know. Because they stopped serving beer like five hours ago. They, what? Did, a, I mean, they did a 14th inning stretch. Well, you said people can leak. Can yeah, that's a funny yeah. thing yeah. about the yeah. game. Yeah, they usually start yeah. serving, yeah. stop yeah. serving yeah. beer, I don't know, seventh yeah. inning. No. And when the game goes 16 yeah. innings, do they start serving yeah. beer again, or do you just have to yeah. sober up and get a hangover yeah. while you're at the yeah. game? Well, Oh, that yeah, game was in Chicago. I just assumed it was in Colorado, and they would say the time difference. Wow. So that game to one of that late in Chicago. Wow. All right, I think I've got this all wired correctly. I'll do a little test with the speaker to make sure before I insert a bit of cardboard. I figured I would wait until I had the speaker come repaired so I could test both my rewiring job and the cone, and I'm happy to say that everything's working fine. No more raspiness in the cone, and obviously I got the wiring correct. Now something else I did was I hooked up the muting switch. It's a red wire coming down here. So, I think I can demonstrate how this was supposed to work. If you pull this all the way out, it mutes the radio. And you go around the dial and you shouldn't hear anything. Now occasionally you do. A little bit of static comes through. Or occasionally a little bit of a station leaks through. Reason for that? Well, two possibilities. One, there's a metal contact, this little nub here that rides along this brass track. Now here's another backing plate. This one is absolutely filthy. So as you can imagine, this is rotating around, metal on metal there. It's not making very good contact. Other possibility is there's also a switch inside here, and that might be a little bit dirty, but I think it's really just this contact. Now, on this one, I've polished up that brass, and I've even sprayed it with some deoxid. But I think the reality is, with just a big exposed piece of metal like that, and this is a little nub here with just a little bit of pressure on it, rubbing up against it, I think it's occasionally going to just skip and skid, or maybe a little bit of dust on the track, especially on this model, because this dial is going to face straight up. And occasionally a little bit of dirt's going to work its way down there, or a little bit of corrosion, and it's just not going to work perfectly. Alright, so anyways, next position, it's unmuted, this is your manual tuning. Sydney Rice and Gerald Comission were here, thanks. Now, for the presets, you would normally, you'd have it all the way out until you've got around where a preset is that you want, a station that you want to hear, and then you'd shove the plunger down. So, as you do that, you go from muted to unmuted, back to muted again, and then once you shove the knob all the way in, you're unmuted again. Or perhaps, that's not quite right, perhaps when you just want to use the presets, you pull this out part way. Well, now you kind of have to go out, at least to this position, if not all the way. No, it must be, you're supposed to go all the way. If you don't go all the way, this immediate, immediate position, you bump into the cones. So you can't possibly do that. So I'm sure you're supposed to go out all the way. It's supposed to be dead silent. Come around to your preset, and you push this all the way down. Now, if you miss a cone like I just did there, it's also supposed to stay muted. So you get over to the cone. And you wind up pretty close, and you miss like I just did. <laughs> Try that again, and then you hear your station. Oh, 
Okay, so, yeah, mine's not working 100%, but it's, it's more or less working, but there's another issue here. You notice, there's no marking on the dial here. Well, things have changed a bit since the dial was made. Now, some of these are still valid, like WIND. Still there. But, no station here. Tax license to MAQ, we're okay. GM, we're okay. BBM, uh, hey, there's nothing there. Well, that's because they've changed the frequency. It's not 770 anymore, it's 780. And WLS is no longer 870. Set up an entire system for you. CFL, well, well they've, they've changed the call letters, but it's not at 970. Ten minute, we're conspicuous. So, 1,000. So, if I wanted to really use this and have the presets actually be on stations, a few of them would be okay. But for the others, well, like the one I was demonstrating over here. Uh, there's no going to be no tick on the dial. There's no tick on the dial. And you don't have it out on the workbench where you can see the cones. You're never going to be able to, fi you're going to have a very hard time figuring out where to position this and then push the plunger down to lock on the cone. So, I think I'm just going to leave it disconnected. Another option, I suppose, if you're really obsessive and you really want to have this working right, is you have yourself a new dial made up with markers for the modern station layouts. What I'll probably do, I suppose, is I'll set up cones on the stations that are still valid. WIND, WMAQ, WGN and any others that might still be valid. And I'll, I'll line those up, so at least that mechanism works. But I might just go ahead and leave that kill switch disconnected. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'll leave it enabled for now, and just see how well it even works. You can see right now it's supposed to be muted, but it's all the way out, but it's not. So, definitely a flaky mechanism. Alright, so, basically wrapped up with this project, I still need to reattach this cap, and there's one last thing I want to do, before I completely put to rest that 6K7 situation. Uh, there we go. <laughs> so I still want to try using uh, this, and that, and that Philco 38 time like I mentioned, but... I got some comments from somebody who restored a Philco 38.7. He uh, also seemed to have trouble with those 100 picofarad caps that are hiding inside the second IF can. And he sent me some details of how he uh, sort of bypassed these without doing anything inside the can. In other words, he left these in place. Well, after seeing his description and some photos, I figured out what he did. So, keep in mind, these two variable caps, these two coils, 51K resistor and 200 picofarad caps, that's all inside the can. So we got a wire coming out here, a wire coming out here, green wire there, broad wire there, and there's a fifth wire going to ground. But there's no wire to this point. So it's not so easy to have external caps going unless you rewire this and run a wire out to this point. Well, what he did is he cut this wire and he put a cap between that junction and ground. And it seemed to improve things considerably. He also put one in parallel with that cap. So what I think he did, in effect, was if either one of these caps are leaky to ground, and you break that and put a cap in there to ground, 
it's not going to be 100% because you're going to be altering these capacitances a little bit and they're still, a little, they're still leaky, but you've broken that path to ground. I want to give that a try. Because perhaps what I, the situation I've got is I'm losing a little bit of gain and it only works with this one or two particular 6K7s I've come across because they just have enough gain at the, the operating point that the tube is set at. And maybe I've got some uh, high resistance leakage going on in here too. And maybe by putting that cap in there, it'll work with a weaker tube or a tube that's uh, not uh, not uh, up to par. There's my mica cap floating in space. The greenish striped wire that, that was going to ground. I just disconnected it and threw a cap in series with it. 125 pico fare just because I had one handy. I had to put that Filco 6K7G back in the radio. Let's see if it made any difference. <laughs> nope, same old problem returned. Right about the three, four minute mark. Could hear the volume drop in a couple stops and now it's almost gone. Can't even get WG in there's barely. Some stations are okay, but again it's a volume at a hundred percent. It should be much, much louder. Alright, so that didn't solve it, so I'm gonna go back, re re restore that wiring, put the other 6K7 back in, and I'm calling this done.